I'll watch television once a year just to get a kind of an idea of what is happening to people's minds. Or maybe I want to go see the World Series. The frequency of images is so fast that I can't track it. If I don't, I don't have TV and I don't like them. So I can't understand how people can watch them. The frequency of the images is just too fast. I can't take it all in. Um, yeah, it, it is, uh, you're absolutely right, that we're thinking differently. Um, television alters consciousness. If it didn't, they wouldn't use it. it it's, int it's intended to alter consciousness. Me, the last TV set I had, I shot. Um, I don't know what commercial importunment drove me off of the pier, but I hauled it into the backyard. It was up in Spokane, Washington, and I got a, had an old Stevens shotgun. I, I, I tied a, a scarf around it for a blindfold and scotch taped a cigarette to the front and lit it and let it burn an appropriate amount of time, and then I blew a hole through it with the shotgun. It was out there in the lilac hedge. It, which grew through it eventually. It was kind of pretty after a while. But I have not, you know, I haven't owned, owned one of those foolish things since. I think um, that ab abandoning children, you know, to television set, children are born with this, with this bridge between world time and dream time. They wander back and forth over it at will. And you never know which side of the bridge they're going to be standing at either. You just got to be willing to stand with them at the dream time end of the bridge instead of jerking them over the bridge into world time on the presumption that facts will save your butt. Have they? Well, they won't. Um, kids understand storytelling. They understand stories and they understand that particular kind of magic. And they also understand that innately that all the wonders of the mind need not be explicit. Uh, we're robbing children of their imagination. We just said earlier that the glory of radio is that it, it unlocks the imagination, as my wife said. And television, because you create your own images, and television gives you, gives you the images. Also, television is there to say to these kids, uh, see, it, kids, um, you can take a, a coffee can and turn it into a rocket ship, you see. And you, you create the story. Uh, you, you have the story and you, that you want to act out, and then you create the object to act it out. Television turns that around backwards and says, you can't have this story unless you buy the object. The exact opposite of, of what we're born to do. We have to fight like hell to turn ourselves back to our own best natural selves. And that's part of what I'm, what I'm doing. Utah, we're speaking on this weekend that would have been Martin Luther King's 75th birthday, mm -hmm. um, who came out of a fierce tradition of civil rights protest and human rights activism. Um, a lot of people don't appreciate what that day-to-day -day organizing and activism is all about. They hear Martin Luther King, it's almost as if he was alone, but he certainly wasn't. Um, and there were so many, like you mentioned Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks, a story, a legend, where we hear about a woman who just got tired and sat down. But of course, no, that was not she was at story. Highlander School getting her training. Can you talk about what Highlander School was? Oh, good heavens, that Miles Horton... <laughs> <clears throat> Miles Horton was the world, the best educator the country ever had. And I knew Miles. He was a re fine, remarkable man. Good preacher, too. Um, the Highlander principle was that any, any group of people in the community experiencing a problem, if they sit in a circle and spend a couple of days telling each other their life story, will eventually arrive at a solution to the problem. So the Highlander School is created for people to come together and do that so that food is prepared for them and a place to stay. And, uh, and if, you, if you run into a naughty problem um, and you need a lawyer or you need an expert, uh, and, you know, X is a has-been, a spurt is a drip under pressure, you need an expert, come in there, uh, they'll come in and, and tell you what you want to hear, and then they have to leave. You know how a lawyer can take over a meeting. And then you go back and just use the information because it's right in the hands of those people uh, to, to do that. And that was, that's where Rosa Parks was. Martin Luther King was there. Remember that billboard uh, during the 60s that the John Birch Society put up said Martin Luther King at a communist training school? That was Highlander, you know, that he was at. And uh, it, it, it's, um, 
And, and, and with Miles' idea, an extraordinary idea that works, Miles was a great organizer by himself. Miles Horton told me once, he said he was uh, doing an organizing job in a little small town, a coal mine uh, job. And the, the thugs were in town, and they were going to try to break the union, you know, pretty violent. The preacher feared for Miles' life and gave him a horse pistol to protect himself, but it was broken and it didn't have any ammunition, and Miles said he didn't know how to use it anyway. Well, Miles was looking out the front window down on the street from the rooming house, and a big black car pulled up, and the, the three goons got out. And Miles opened the window, and dangling that pistol out the window said, Hey, you down there, let me tell you something. And he looked up and said, Horton, you can't tell us anything. He said, Oh, yes, I can. You've got to get organized. He said, What do you mean? He said, You're not organized. What do you mean? He said, Well, now look, you're going to come upstairs and try to kill me. You're going to kick in my door. I'm going to shoot the first one inside the door, and I may get the second one. Third one will get me, but you've got to decide which one's going to come in first. You've got to get organized. Well, they talked to each other for a while and got in the car and drove away. <laughs> Miles could do that. One time, he would, Miles, he, did a, he was invited to give a talk on leadership. And he showed up in town, and he couldn't uh, remember where he was supposed to go. He lost a piece of paper. So he walked up to the main part of town, and he saw a bunch of people going into a hall. So he followed them. And he went in there and uh, saw his name on the reader board, and, and everybody sat down, and he sat down. When they were all sat down, he got up and walked to the front, onto the stage, and said, Leadership is finding a bunch of people who look like they know where they're going and following them, and when they're all sitting down, stand up and talk to them about leadership. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about commercial media and what it's done. What radio that is commercial, record industry, the music industry, how you respond to it. And I also wanted to ask you about Johnny Cash. The, um, isn't, that, isn't that the little bill changers in public restrooms? It's, they, <laughs> forget it. Yeah, my brain does that. Listen, I'm a victim of this myself. You know, I'm a bystander. I'm not doing this. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, you started out with uh, what media has done to people. You know that better than I do. That's why you do what you do. See, you're doing an alternative media. And uh, if we play our cards right and give we have enough time, then uh, pretty soon it won't be the alternative media anymore. But then we have a thorough understanding, don't we, Amy, that uh, they fight with money and we fight with time, and they're going to run out of money before we run out of time. So we'll just be patient. You do your work and I'll do mine. And we'll catch up and overtake them. Um, it's a damn shame, though, that we have to be alternative. Uh, but then we're in a capitalist environment. We're in a capitalist system. Uh, that's built on that's built on the least commendable features of the human psyche, greed and envy, rather than the best. Uh, we, in community radio, in pirate radio, in alternative music distribution, uh, we reach for the best in people. You know, we don't we don't not lowest common denominators, and we're we are building a new world within the shell of the old. Uh, I don't feel pessimistic about that at all. There's simply too many good people right here in this room, too many good people on the street, close to the street, um, doing too many good things for me to afford the luxury of being pessimistic. See, I'm gonna, I'll tell people that tonight, damn it. I, I'm glad it came up. If I look at the world from the top down, from Fox, God help me, or CNN, or there ought to be a CNN on to wean people from that idiocy. Yeah, if I look at it from the top down, I get seriously depressed. The world's going to hell in a wheelbarrow. But if I walk out the door, turn all that off, and, and go with the people, whatever town I'm in, who are doing the real work down at the street level, like I say, there's too, much, too many good people doing too many good things for me to let myself be pessimistic about that. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful. Can't live without hope, can you? 